Today's homily, I want to talk about tradition because this is an incredibly important concept to get if you want to understand the Catholic thing, the Catholic faith. You've got to understand what we mean when we say tradition. Because today our Lord is railing against uh, the Pharisees and they're clinging to human tradition or traditions of men. Uh, so very big key distinction has got to be made between small t tradition, kind of like the church's discipline that is you know, it can be changed, okay? And capital T tradition, sacred tradition, which is part of the doctrine of the faith, okay? It's part of the word of God. It's an instantiation of God's word, okay? Impressed on the heart of the church. So this is what we got to really understand. Our Lord is talking about human traditions, traditions of men, uh, but that word is used in two different senses in the New Testament, sometimes as capital T tradition, where it's reverenced as part of the word of God. And in this case and in other cases, St. Paul, our Lord, you know, also refers to human tradition in the small t sense. And that sometimes is thrown at Catholics and thrown in their face and say, see, you Catholics are clinging to your human traditions and they lump all tradition together. They don't make that key distinction and they don't understand the Catholic thing that we believe in sacred tradition. The word of God impressed on the heart of the church. We'll get to that. Let's focus on human tradition right now. What is it that our Lord's dealing with? The Pharisees, the perishing. They call themselves the pure ones, the holy ones, okay? They're like separatists. Hey, our Lord is the holy one of Israel. He is the pure one that they're standing there talking to. That's what's so ironic in this whole story. And here he is, they're bickering with him. He's the Messiah. He's the authoritative interpreter of Torah as the Messiah. He is the living Torah for lying out crowd. All right, and that's who they're debating with here, trapping, setting traps for him, trying to tempt him, trying to get, get him to say something that they can accuse him. And we got to talk about tradition, and I think the uh, best thing I can read for you is a little excerpt from the Mishnah. The Mishnah are Jewish tractates composed by rabbis, a whole bunch of these tractates. Uh, to, to explain, to break down the interpretation of many of the 613 commandments of Moses in the Old Testament. Okay, so how do we understand kosher laws, dietary kosher laws, laws of purification, what's clean, what's unclean? We don't want to defile ourselves. We want to keep our ritual purity, so we got to know. And this is, uh, they spent a lot of time on this kind of stuff. Wrote long uh, tractates on this and I'm going to read an excerpt from one of them and this is exactly the kind of thing our Lord is dealing with here that's why St. Matthew's excuse me St. Mark he's like Peter's secretary presumably this was written in Rome and Mark was Peter's secretary for a time and he's basically writing because he wasn't an apostle Mark wasn't an apostle so this is what we presume to be Peter's memoirs. Okay, we're pretty sure of that. This is Peter's gospel more than anything. Uh, Mark is just simply writing down the memoirs of St. Peter here. He's writing to Romans, Gentiles largely, so as the audience that he they have in mind when they're writing this gospel, that's why they go to the great lengths in Mark's version of this story. He gives you all these details, like, you know, he explains uh, what the Jews mean by defile. That means they haven't you know, they have to wash their hands, all the things. And he gives us this little extra parenthetical explanation about the Jews. You know, when they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they purify themselves. And there are many other traditions which they observe. The washing of cups and pots and vessels of bronze. The little deep extra details he adds there so his readership understands uh, the Jewish customs around purity, ritual purity and cleansing. So now I'm going to read a tractate in that context. Let's hear a little bit of the Jewish Mishnah. A hollow vessel made of pottery could contract uncleanness inside but not outside. 
That is to say, it did not matter who or what touched it outside, but it did matter what touched it inside. If it became unclean, it must be broken, and no unbroken piece must remain, which was big enough to hold enough oil to anoint the little toe. A flat plate without a rim could not become unclean at all, but a flat plate, but a plate with a rim could. If vessels made with leather, bone, or glass were flat, they could not un contract uncleanness at all. If they were hollow, they could become unclean outside and inside. If they were unclean, they must be broken, and the break must be a hole at least big enough for a medium-sized pomegranate to pass through. To cure uncleanness, earthen vessels must be broken. Other vessels must be immersed, boiled, purged with fire, or in the case of metal vessels, polished. A three-legged table could contract uncleanness. If it lost one or two legs, it could not. If it lost three legs, it could, for then it could be used as a board, and a board could become unclean. Things made of metal could become unclean, except a door, a bolt, a lock, a hinge, a knocker, and a gutter. Wood used in metal utensils could become unclean, but metal used in wood utensils could not. Thus, a wooden key with metal teeth could become unclean, but a metal key with wooden teeth could not. Want me to keep going? All right, I think you got the picture. That's why our Lord was apoplectic dealing with these people. He was out of his mind. You know, you guys are totally missing the point. Okay, you're straining a gnat out of your glass of wine so you can maintain your ritual purity, making sure you don't want to swallow a gnat. And you're swallowing a camel instead. Uh, our Lord just cannot. He has a hard time with these guys. Um, so we got to understand what uh, our Lord means here when he's saying you cling to these human traditions, small T traditions. We got to make sure we understand what big T tradition is in the Catholic faith. All right, when we talk about sacred tradition, we should not equate it with what our Lord is railing against here. So the best thing to do is probably turn to the catechism of the Catholic Church here. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about divine revelation and let's talk about how it's transmitted. Some of it was written down. But very little, very few of the apostles wrote anything. Our Lord didn't write anything that we know of. And as far as we know, he didn't instruct the apostles to write anything. We know he told them to preach and teach orally. But only three out of the 12 apostles actually wrote anything down that we know of. You got Matthew and John and Peter, that's it. Mark and Luke and Paul and I would argue James and Jude uh, are cousins of the Lord. They're not part of the 12 apostles. That's what I think. Anyway, so five of the authors of the New Testament are not apostles. They're men who are associated with the apostles. Right? Uh, they received this teaching from the apostles. So. So, yeah, what do you make of all that? I mean, the bottom line is this word of God was passed along orally first. Began with our Lord himself in the choice of 12 men. And for three years, he worked on them and formed them. This is the, the most unprecedented, unique formation in the history of the human race. These 12 guys got, they were part of his inner circle. Got to hang out with the Son of God, who very carefully, deliberately prepared them as foundation stones. As the wise, wise builder that he was, he laid these stones nice and solid, these 12 guys. He formed them, impressed himself, he, the living word, he impressed himself upon their hearts. Everything he did was teaching, just being in his presence was teaching. Watching him conduct himself in all sorts of pastoral circumstances, deal with adversity of all kinds. Yes, he taught them orally on roads, walking, uh, hanging out, all different kinds of uh, oral teaching and instruction that he gave them, sure. But uh, all of it was instruction. Three years, 
impressing himself on their hearts first before anything was ever written down. And then eventually the New Testament came forth out of the heart of the church. That's what the catechism said. The first generations of Christians did not yet have a written New Testament. And the New Testament itself demonstrates the process of living tradition. It's really kind of difficult to grasp what tradition is. But it's a living thing. It's the word of God in the heart of the church. Traceable from our hearts all the way back to the apostles and to our Lord himself ultimately. And it's passed along. It's passed along and along and along. It's part of uh, sacred tradition and sacred scripture go together. When we uh, talk about the word of God, we shouldn't think of that as simply, I mean, yeah, sometimes we use it in an exclusive sense. We refer to the scriptures as the word of God. But in the fullest possible sense, down here, when we refer to the word of God, we're referring to both sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Um, ultimately, our, the Lord himself is the word of God. Huh? This isn't a religion of a book. Uh, ultimately, it's the religion of the word of God, capital W. He's in heaven. Um, our Lord is the word of God. But our Lord lives inside the heart of the church. He's impressed himself on our heart. And sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate with the other. For both of them flowing out from the same divine wellspring, namely Jesus himself. Come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. So look at, uh, this is the, if somebody asks you, I've heard Protestants debate, you know, in debates with Catholics and they just throw their arms up when Catholics start talking about tradition. They're like, well, what is tradition? What is it? No one's been able to explain it to me. I don't understand what tradition is. All right, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, the catechism tries to explain it, but I don't know how clear this is. Through tradition, the church in her doctrine, life, and worship perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is, all that she believes. Uh, i got to unpack that a little bit. I think the, most, the best, most concrete way to explain to somebody, if they ask you, what is Catholic tradition? I don't understand. Say, it's the catechism of the Catholic Church. Okay, this is the instantiation of our tradition. This is a summary statement of what we believe. What we believe and how we worship. Liturgy and sacraments. How we are to live the moral life. And how we're to pray the spiritual life. Okay, It's made up of four parts. Creed, cult, code, and prayer. Okay, So it begins by going through everything we believe. What do we believe? The creed. Goes article by article in the first part through the creed. Then it explains all the sacraments and the liturgy of the church. How we worship. And then it explains the moral life. And works through the Ten Commandments and all the principles and teaching of the, around the moral life. And last, the fourth part is on prayer. If you read nothing else, make sure you read that section on prayer. It's only like 70 pages, but it's the best. Awesome. So this is kind of like, look, it's popes. It's all the councils of the church. It's all the early Christian theologians we call the fathers of the church, many of whom were doctors of the church. It's, it's the whole church, 2,000 plus year history of saints, doctors, theologians, councils, popes, reflecting on the word of God. Um, it's like a lens living tradition, this, this sacred tradition. It's kind of like a lens that our Lord impressed this word, kind of like a lens, an interpretive lens, a power of discernment that we all have. There's a supernatural sense of the faithful we all have because this thing is like living. It's in our hearts. There's a certain power of discernment exercised by the entire church, the sense of the faithful. A power of discernment that we all exercise collectively. That's also represented in the church's doctrine. Some of these things are discerned like a dimmer switch on the wall. The church discerned which 27 books were going to make up the New Testament. There are lots of New Testament 
time, in that time frame, lots of writings floating around. But the church prayed with all these things and the church began to discern. Okay, this is inspired. This is not. And it took a while, like a dimmer switch. That's the process of living tradition, this power of discernment. It's the living word of God in the heart of the church. So tricky to explain. But look, the catechism is like the interpretation of the scriptures over 2,000 years. Largely, that's what this is. And this is kind of like the horse. And this is like the rider. They go together like horse and rider. You know, as the Bible doesn't interpret itself. And so they kind of go like this. And they flow from the same divine wellspring, our Lord himself, ultimately, okay? Scripture and tradition. And this catechism, anybody tells you, you know, whatever, tries to separate them. Look, hey, this is absolutely saturated with this. This catechism is saturated with the Bible. It's 688 pages. There are 4,219 citations of sacred scripture in the catechism. That's 6.1 per page on average. Yes, I counted them all. All right. Absolutely saturated with the Bible. Uh, these two things, they come from the same divine wellspring. They flow together. They uh, form one thing in the end. They wash together and back and forth. Okay, so look, the scriptures came from tradition. But yet, you know, once we have that written, inspired word of God, then tradition also comments and, and reflects on scripture as well. It's, um, I don't know if I can explain it any better than that, folks, but I'm going to just uh, read a couple of scripture passages, try to bring this home. When St. Paul talks about the nature of this sacred tradition, he does not mean the same thing that our Lord did today. He means something entirely different. He takes it very seriously and considers it part of the word of God. This, this is 1 Corinthians 11, 2. I commend you because you remember me and everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them to you. More importantly, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15 is very important. Uh, this is probably the most quoted text when we talk about this, these things. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions. Here he's talking about sacred traditions, not the human traditions our Lord's railing against. Stand firm and hold to the traditions which were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. So whether it was in writing or it was by word of mouth. It's getting pretty long. Sorry, I'm going to close out with, uh, hey, why don't I just read from James uh, chapter one here, what we read in the second reading. There's some nice little nuggets in here that are applicable. Listen, um, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. It's an implanted word. Remember the parable of the sower and the seed. The seed is the word of God. The soil is our hearts. It gets planted in our hearts and grows the word of God. When you read the Acts of the Apostles, what do you hear about? You hear about the word of God. It's like a living thing. And it's like increasing and growing. It's spreading. Uh, they talk about it like it's a real thing. Uh, because it is. And they're talking about tradition. Ultimately, this, this transmission orally, uh, this word that uh, people have impressed on their hearts began with our Lord and then the Apostles. And then the apostles preaching and others impressed on their hearts and they passed along. The word of God began to grow and increase this implanted word in our hearts. We are to receive with meekness this implanted word. And I think I'll just end right there. But look, just be aware of it in your own hearts. Be aware of it. Uh, that this includes us and think, wow, this impressed, implanted word is in our hearts too.